Dear friends, welcome to the concluding lecture on the subject of media ethics and law in the ongoing course in journalism and mass communication. In the previous lectures on this subject, we had discussed issues that comprise the vast and sensitive issue of media ethics and the role of the press council. In the present discussion that follows, we shall talk about the regulations for the broadcast media, films, advertising, as also the most significant and talked about issue of sting operations by the media. So we move on to broadcast media now. The broadcast media in India was under almost a complete monopoly of the government of India during the years when All India Radio and Doordarshan used to be the two agencies responsible for all audio-visual broadcast. It included news and entertainment programs. Private organizations were involved only in commercial advertising and sponsorship of programs. However, it was in 1995 that the Supreme Court ruled that the government had no monopoly over such electronic media as such the monopolistic power of the government was not mentioned anywhere in the constitution or any other law prevailing in the country. This ruling brought about a great change in the position prevailing in the broadcast media and the sectors became open to citizens as well as private operators. The Broadcasting Code adopted by the 4th Asian Broadcasting Conference in 1962 listing certain cardinal principles to be followed by the electronic media is of prime importance so far as laws governing broadcast media are concerned. Although the broadcast code was chiefly set up to govern the All India Radio Broadcast Guidelines, the following cardinal principles have ideally been practiced by all broadcasting and television organizations. The principles are as such. To ensure the objective presentation of news and fair and unbiased comment, to promote the advancement of education and culture, to raise and maintain high standards of decency and decorum in all programs, to provide programs for the young which by variety and content should inculcate the principles of good citizenship, to promote communal harmony, religious tolerance and international understanding to treat controversial public issues in an impartial and dispassionate manner and to respect human rights and dignity. The Cable Television Networks Regulation Act 1995 basically regulates the operation of cable television in the territory of India and regulates the subscription rates and the total number of subscribers receiving programs transmitted in the basic tier of broadcasting. In pursuance of the Cable Television Network Regulation Amendment Bill 2002, the central government may make it obligatory for every cable operator to transmit or retransmit programs of any pay channel through an addressable system as and when the central government so notifies. Such notification may also specify the number of free to air channels to be included in the package of channels forming the basic service tier. So this act that is the Cable Television Networks Regulation Act 1995 is the major law governing the broadcast of television channels in India today. The direct to home or DTH broadcasting service that followed in later years and continues to be quite 
popular and prevalent in all over India today refers to the distribution of multi-channel TV programs in KU band by using a satellite system and by providing TV signals directly to the subscriber's premises without passing through an intermediary such as cable operators. So as far as the broadcasting of TV programs either through a cable network or through the DTH service is concerned, it is this act which governs the broadcasting system. Then we come to films. India is one of the largest producers of motion pictures in the world. Encompassing three major spheres of activity, production, distribution and exhibition, the industry has an all India spread, employing thousands of people and entertaining millions each year. The various laws in force regulating and making and screening of films including documentaries, news features, feature films, entertainment and educational films and all sorts of feature films are as follows. The Cinematograph Act 1952. This act makes provisions for a certification of cinematographed films for exhibition by means of cinematograph or the equipment or machinery through which a pre-recorded and processed film is screened on a screen in front. Under this act, a board of film censors, now renamed as the Central Board of Film Certification with advisory panels at regional centers, is empowered to examine every film and sanction it whether for unrestricted exhibition or for exhibition restricted to adults. The board is also empowered to refuse to sanction a film for public exhibition. In a very well known case referred to as the K. A. Abbas vs. the Union of India case, the petitioner for the first time challenged the validity of censorship as violative of his fundamental right of speech and expression. The Supreme Court, however, observed that pre-censorship of films under the Cinematograph Act was justified under Article 19.2 on the ground that films have to be treated separately from other forms of art and expression because a motion picture was able to stir up emotions more deeply and widely and thus classification of films between two categories A for adults and U for universal or unrestricted exhibition was brought about. Later another category named as UA was added which meant that minors below the age of 18 would be allowed to view a film only if they were accompanied by an adult since the contents of the films thus certified were mature and the people the viewers who were not adults needed some adult guidance to be with them then there is the copyright act 1957 according to which copyright means the <coughs> exclusive right to commercially exploit the original literary dramatic artistic musical work sound recordings or cinematographic films as per the wishes of the owner of the copyright subject to the restrictions imposed in the act although this act is applicable to all the branches of media in some areas it is specific to this particular segment in the case of a cinematographed film to do or to authorize the doing of any of the following acts would lead to the infringement of copyright and will be treated as such these acts or areas are as follows to make a copy of the film to cause the film 
in so far as it consists of visual images to be seen in public and in so far as it consists of sounds to be heard in public to make any record embodying the recording in any part of the soundtrack associated with the film by utilizing such soundtrack and to communicate the film by radio diffusion or through wireless distribution the act also makes it a cognizable offense for anyone to sell hire distribute exhibit possess or view any unauthorized recordings and prescribes severe penalties including imprisonment fines as well as confiscation of the equipment used for the purpose of such recording and exhibition the amendments to the copyright act also prohibit unauthorized transmission of films on the cable television network another act is the cine workers and cinema theater workers regulation of employment act 1981 This legislation affords a measure of protection to those employed in the industry by imposing certain obligations on motion picture producers and theater owners concerning the former's condition of service. A similar act is the Cine Workers Welfare Cess Act 1981 and Cine Workers Welfare Fund Act 1981. these two acts seek to create means of financial support to cine employees the seasonal and unpredictable nature of whose employment often leaves them impoverished and helpless so we now take up advertising as the next form of media and the laws applicable to it advertising communication is a mix of arts and facts subservient to ethical principles in order to be consumer oriented advertisement will have to be truthful and ethical it should not mislead the consumer if it so happens the credibility is lost even though an advertisement is supposed to be paid communication with specific commercial interest behind it it has to be truthful and it has to follow certain laws so that the consumer and the public in general is not misled in order to enforce an ethical regulating code the advertising standards council of india or the asci was set up inspired by a similar code of the advertising standards authority or asa of the uk the indian council follows the following basic guidelines in order to achieve the acceptance of fair advertising practices in the interests of the consumer the points are to ensure the truthfulness and honesty of representations and claims made by advertisements and to safeguard against misleading advertising to ensure that advertisements are not offensive to generally accepted standards of public decency to safeguard against indiscriminate use of advertising for promotion of products which are regarded as hazardous to society or to individuals to a degree or of a type which is unacceptable to society at large <coughs> and to ensure that advertisements observe fairness in competition so that the consumers need to be informed on choices in the marketplaces and canons of generally competitive behavior in business are both served other legislations connected to advertising are as follows the drugs and magic remedies objectionable advertisements act 1954 this act has been enacted to control the advertisements of drugs in certain cases and to
prohibit the advertisements for certain purposes of remedies alleged to possess magical qualities and to provide for matters connected therewith in a well known case of hamdard dawakhana versus the union of india the supreme court was faced with the question as to whether the drug and magic remedies act was valid as it curbed the freedom of speech and expression of a person by imposing restrictions on some kinds of advertisements the supreme court held that an advertisement is no doubt a form of speech and expression but every advertisement is not a matter dealing with the expression of ideas and hence advertisements of commercial nature cannot fall within the concept of article 19 1a that guarantees freedom of expression however in another case of the tata press limited versus mahanagar telephone limited a three judge bench of the supreme court differed from the view expressed in the hamdard dawakhana case and held that commercial advertisements was definitely a part of the article 19 1a as it aimed at the dissemination of information regarding a product the court however made it clear that the government could regulate commercial advertisements which are deceptive unfair misleading and untruthful the advertising standards council of india is an industry organization which in tries to enforce a self designed code of conduct and consumers are encouraged to file their complaints regarding any advertisement which they consider un inappropriate in any manner another act is the monopolies and restrictive trade practices act 1969 This act deals with five major unfair trade practices which are related to the media sector. Number 1 any misleading false and wrong representation either in writing such as in advertisements warranty and guarantee and commercial statements etc or oral at the time of the sale actual or intended even if actual injury or loss is not caused to the consumer or buyer constitutes as unfair trade practice number 2 sales where there is an element of deception number 3 all business promotion schemes announcing free gifts contests etc where an element of deception is involved number 4 violation of laws existing for the protection of consumers and number 5 manipulating sales with a view to raising prices in a case pertaining to parle company's mango drink maza there was an advertisement of the manga maza mango drink and the mrtp issued a legal notice against parle exports private limited the company which used to make the maza drink the advertisement implied that the drink was prepared from fresh mango while actually preservatives were added to it the company had to suspend production pending an inquiry and later companies had to give in writing on the products whether the drinks contained artificial preservatives and contents or natural contents let us now come to a most well known but controversial practice of journalism that is sting operations and the laws regarding this practice in the last few years the electronic media has resorted to many tactics to keep ahead in the highly competitive industry one important aspect is the sting operation it involves the use of hidden cameras by journalists who either move about under a fictitious name or station themselves at a strategic place or a road corner 
or some other place within an office or outside and record some incriminating piece of conversation, news, information or visuals that can be broadcast or telecast at a later stage of time. The intention is to catch someone off guard or unawares and record those few minutes or moments when something newsworthy takes place and then package those visuals into a news bulletin. It involves several issues mainly of ethics, technology, accountability, timing, intention, conflict of interest and so on. A law commission consultation paper on sting operations has given some insightful observations about this phenomena. The note says that technology is offering many ways to invade private and professional space and lives. The media with the help of private entities is making effective use of such technological opportunity to carry out the sting operations to expose corruption, immorality, exploitation, flouting of the rule of law by those holding public offices, influential persons and businessmen. However, the report noted that in some high profile criminal cases, the media by conducting a sting operation and broadcasting the same on TV channels regularly have been prompted by a motive to play up the emotions and sensationalize the events for a commercial purpose. It has a tendency to generate public opinion in a particular direction much to the embarrassment of law enforcement agencies. Instances are not lacking where instant SMS polls have been held to decide between guilt and innocence. Such parallel proceedings by the media in a criminal case pending before a court of law can create a forceful impression on the public minds about guilt and might affect a fair trial and uninhibited verdict which is a part of the constitutional guarantee to every citizen of India. On one hand, sting operations serve the public interest by strengthening the democratic framework by disseminating information about facts of vital interest to society that are not easy to obtain by simple requests or efforts. Examples show that without the use of sting operations, the public would have never learnt about many economic and political wrongdoings. On the other hand, some recent incidents prove its misuse by the media and private entities to increase the channel viewership, settle political scores, harm corporate interests and malign reputations of people in public life. Such sting operations that are carried on with ulterior motives not only harm the person and the institution trapped in the sting, but they have also the potential to shake people's faith in the institutions and create a general environment of cynicism in the society. The note said that the only law at the moment to cover this activity was of course the Cable Television Network's Regulation Act 1995 and the rules framed thereunder. This act and rules belong to an era when sting operations had not arrived on the television scene and they do not have any direct provisions related to the sting operations. At the same time, some provisions of this act may be applied to check malpractices associated with sting operations because section 3 and 5 read with the program code referred to in section 6 lay down that no program can be transmitted or retransmitted 
on any cable service which contains anything that is obscene, defamatory, deliberate, false and suggestive innuendos and half-truths. The Committee on Petitions of the Raj Sabha in its report dated 12th December 2008 made the following very pertinent observations. To quote, the committee feels that the electronic media should not air information gathered through sting operations unless and until there is ample evidence to conclusively prove the guilt of the alleged accused. If it is required in public interest, the version of the alleged accused should also be aired simultaneously and with equal prominence. Where a sting operation is found to be false and fabricated, the media company responsible for producing it ought to be given a stringent punitive punishment commensurate with the damage caused to the innocent individual and the committee is of the view that freedom of the press is essential for healthy functioning of democracy. However, democracy comes with responsibility. Freedom of the press can cause responsibility on media as well. The committee therefore expects the media to contribute to success of democracy by protecting the freedom of individual including his or her right to privacy. The committee observes that even though the right to know takes precedence over the right to privacy, the right of privacy should not be encroached upon under the garb of freedom of the press unless prompted by genuine public interest. Therefore, the committee advocates the following of a middle path approach between both the rights to meet the ends of justice. The government of India proposed to set up an independent regulatory authority that is the Broadcasting Regulatory Authority of India or BRAI under a proposed law that is the Broadcasting Services Regulation Bill 2007. The accompanying content code revised in March 2008 lays down in detail what content can be aired and what cannot, but it has met with strong opposition from the media agencies, companies, channel owners who will prefer self-regulation. It was later agreed that a national broadcasting authority a statutory body will be set up but it will not regulate the content. However, the Ministry for Information and Broadcasting has devised certain non-statutory and informal guidelines and machinery to check objectionable publications or exhibition of material. For instance, an electronic media monitoring center has been set up to undertake monitoring of the contents of various FM radio and television channels for any violation of the program code, the advertisement code and the provisions of the Cable TV Networks Regulation Act. While so, the News Broadcasting Association or NBA has been formed to put in place a self-regulatory mechanism and accordingly the News Broadcasting Standards Authority or NBSA was set up in October 2008. The NBSA consists of an eminent retired judge, eminent editors associated with broadcasting and eminent persons having special knowledge in the fields of law, education, medicine, literature, public administration and so on. It has formulated a code of ethics and broadcasting standards governing the broadcasters and television journalists. Broadcaster is defined to mean any association of persons or organization or 
corporate entity being a member of the NBA who owns, manages and controls a satellite or cable TV channels that comprise exclusively news and current affairs contents or capsules as part of its programming and the said term includes the editor as well. The said authority on the basis of a complaint or otherwise can proceed to hold an inquiry into the alleged violation of code of conduct and after giving an opportunity of hearing to the broadcaster concerned may for reasons recorded in writing warn, censure or impose a fine upon the broadcaster and or recommend the concerned authority for suspension or revocation of license of such broadcaster. The purpose of the principles of self-regulation is stated to be to empower the profession of television journalism by an abiding set of values which will stand the test of time and ensure that balanced and comprehensive journalism flourishes to strengthen India's democracy. As regards Sting operation, it has laid down a code of ethics. It says that as a guiding principle, Sting and undercover operations should be a last resort of a news channel in an attempt to give the viewer comprehensive coverage of any news story. News channels will not allow sex and sleaze as a means to carry out sting operations. The use of narcotics and psychotropic substances or any act of violence, intimidation or discrimination as justifiable means in the recording of any sting operation, news channels will, as a ground rule, ensure that sting operations are carried out only as a tool for getting conclusive evidence of wrongdoing or criminality and that there is no deliberate alteration of visuals or editing or interposing done with the raw footage in a way that it also alters or misrepresents the truth or presents only a portion of the truth. Whether such a self-regulatory mechanism has proved to be adequate and effective and whether it would obviate the need for a statutory mechanism to regulate the contents of broadcasting including sting operations and taking appropriate action under the law is still a matter of debate. Incidentally, in the UK, the Broadcasting Standards Commission exists as the statutory body for regulating both standards and fairness in text, cable and digital services broadcast over television and radio, both terrestrial and satellite. Its decisions are published regularly and broadcasters must report any action they have taken as a result of these regulations. It is accountable to Parliament and each year publishes a full report of its work. It is financed by the government and broadcasters and its accounts are subject to scrutiny by the National Audits Office of the UK. Now we move on to another controversial subject that has come up in recent years by the name of paid news. Paid news or packaging of advertisements as news has existed for some time now. It assumed more serious proportions when several cases of paid news were reported from many states in assembly elections held in 2008 and the Lok Sabha elections held in 2009. In the most common example of paid news, clients ranging from political parties, individuals, corporates and others 
pay either the journalists or the media organization itself for putting together content that is passed off as news but is actually dictated by the client some media organizations have even institutionalized the whole thing by fixing rates for carrying promotional items whether related to news statements product launches commercial or political statements and so on paid news actually undermines the basic precincts of journalism it adulterates news abandoning the separation between news and advertisements thus it cheats the readers however tackling this phenomena is easier said than done there are a number of ways in which business houses and politicians influence journalists and publishers paid news is only one of them the difference now is that a section of the media is now directly demanding payment for publication of news in fact the election commission can deal with publication of campaign advertisements in the form of news under section 10a of the representation of the people's act however its powers are limited and confined to matters connected to election campaign conduct and coverage besides identification of advertisements masquerading as news is not always easy additionally frivolous complaints cannot be ruled out once the commission starts taking action on such complaints during election campaigns candidates may file complaints against the media which carry adverse comments or reports about them saying that they were paid for carrying them moreover there are complaints that newspapers refused coverage because the candidates refused to pay them this is not always easy to prove though that would always happen in a market where news is being paid for many cases could be clinched only if it is proved that money had actually changed hands this would often require police investigation the election commission asked the press council of india to draw broad guidelines to identify advertisements news items and paid news masquerading as advertisement the editors guild of india also joined in the effort and has asked the election commission to take strong action against politicians and media persons for paid news used for election publicity the election commission has on its part asked the editors guild of india to come up with concrete suggestions on how to deal with this problem it is evident that the election commission alone would not be able to tackle the problem which is not confined to election coverage and publicity related to elections if the press council and editors organizations fail to tackle the issue legislation might be the only answer on june 6 2009 the press council of india expressed serious concern over the phenomena of paid news that doubly jeopardized the functioning of an independent media in the country and the working of indian democracy by influencing free and fair elections the council noted that the press provides a service that is akin to public utility it exercises its right to inform because the public has the right to know the press thus functions as a repository of public trust and has the obligation to provide truthful and correct information to the best of its ability when such information is being presented as news content such news content is distinct from opinions that are conveyed through articles and editorials in which writers express their views the securities and exchanges board of india or sebi 
communication to the press council of india pointed out that free and unbiased press is crucial for the development of the securities market particularly with respect to aiding small investors to take a well informed decision and urged the council to address this issue at the earliest in this context the council referred to the existing guidelines for financial journalists that had been framed in 1996 which include the following points number 1 financial journalists should not accept gifts loans trips discounts preferential shares or other considerations which compromise or are likely to compromise his position number 2 it should be mentioned prominently in a report about a company that the report has been based on information provided by the company or its financial sponsors number 3 when trips are sponsored for visiting establishments of a company and hospitality is extended the author of the report who has availed of such facility must invariably state these in his report number 4 a reporter who exposes a scam or brings out a report for promotion of a good project should be encouraged and awarded number 5 a journalist who has a financial interest in a company including holding of shares should not report on that company number 6 the journalist should not use for his personal benefit or for the benefit of his relations or friends information received by him in advance for publication number 7 no newspaper owner editor or anybody connected with the newspaper should use his relationship with the newspaper to promote his other business interests and number 8 whenever there is an indictment of a particular advertising agency or advertiser by the advertising standards council of india the newspaper in which the advertisement was published must published the news of the indictment prominently after deliberating on the issue the press council of india endorsed the views expressed by the sebi and stated that the relevant guidelines should be made applicable and mandatory not only to financial journalists but to owners of media companies as well this would be in the interests of transparency and fairness and would reduce the incidence of biased news about companies being published that is inimical to the interests of investors so we come to the question of credibility dissemination of truth is a basic requirement of the media its explanation and interpretation may of course vary any newspaper that advocates one cause too fiercely loses its readers as it compromises the basic function of communication therefore there is a need for code of ethics the press has to function within the framework of the law of the land generally in a democratic setup the press is not prohibited from printing whatever it wants to but restrictions in terms of obscene defamatory or anti national information are always there in extraordinary times such as war or a general election certain self regulation is expected otherwise the government can enforce such restrictions so here arises the obvious issues of the freedom of the press and its extent and limits it is a concept with roots in history information is considered to be the most vital tool in the struggle for power oppression market control and supremacy either local regional or global the situation has actually remained unchanged in history 
because a free press can inflict irreparable damage to the credibility and longevity of a government the government is forever trying to curb this freedom this is despite the fact that there are constitutional and legal safeguards in favor of the press and its freedom so freedom of the press is a continuing struggle and only members of the press can uphold it one wrong move by a member of the press jeopardizes the chances of any further relief for rest of the press the freedom of the press is dependent on various influences exercised on it the press generally faces three types of influences that is internal external and personal internal F, uh, influence means the requests complaints suggestions recommendations and obligations of colleagues employees seniors and the company's proprietors in the case of a media organization external influence means the request or threats of the news source the authorities that is the administration or the police commercial considerations one's own family members relatives and friends and personal influence means one's own <coughs> moral values personal experiences own sense of guilt defeat victory certain held beliefs such as religious communal physical political or cultural beliefs and superstition the need for media persons is to rise above these considerations as much as possible since we all are humans and cannot be expected to act as almighty feelings of retribution justice fair play an eye for an eye are very natural in individuals also and we all become better human beings by accepting that such feelings exist and then rejecting them on merit and in larger interests of society and people false impressions of grandeur and infallibility can affect journalists in exactly the same way that politicians and film stars are affected and this has been quite evident in recent happenings the growing reach and access of the media both print and electronic has made many journalists feel that they are not only as powerful as others in the power structure or the power elite but that they can also do whatever they please since they are not part of the establishment structure comprising legislature bureaucracy judiciary or even the corporate world with the recent episode of corporate lobbyist neera radia when her conversations with certain well known print and television journalists on political and corporate news were leaked it has become more than apparent that a new kind of journalism has completely rewritten the rules of engagement in the profession for those working with television the glamour and fame can be overpowering with the high visibility translating into widespread fan following fan clubs enormous following on social media networks and a celebrity status on the party circuit news gathered through the corporate conduits slowly and inevitably acquires a legitimacy that eventually allows all lines to be crossed from this to concluding that news cannot be got any other way is a small step the trappings of the power work similarly for politicians and journalists cut off from the rude realities of the normal world both begin to live in a bubble of their own making but where is the politician used to voter mood swings will quickly learn his lesson when the truth hits home the journalist not tutored in this art will react in anger and shock 
and go into spasms of denial. Journalists who enjoy the limelight must also be prepared for the backlash when it comes. Television has actually hugely expanded this mandate with journalism turning into near activism in the studio. Here, the well-known anchor is the judge and jury to the condemned political class. What the tapes have done is to expose this performance as a sham in some cases. The combative anchor who relentlessly interrogates and shames his political guests on the prime time bulletin on TV <coughs> turns into an altogether different character on the tapes, entirely at ease with dubious elements. From the perspective of the trusting outsider, the comfortable relationship between the interrogator, the interrogated and the go-between must surely seem like a rude joke pulled off at his expense. The media needs to introspect more seriously following it up with a clear understanding of the red lines. Care must be taken that public relations executives or lobbyists do not dictate terms and stories so that people do not start treating every story and every journalist with suspicion. Another issue closely related to ethics is that pertaining to journalistic activism. <coughs> so the issue is journalism versus activism. There is a growing trend among some journalists or media writers to become activists as compared to the practice of activists taking to journalism or writing. Examples to quote begin from the freedom struggle when most writers and journalists had a mission before them that was to topple the British regime and gain independence. Over the years the mission became less tangible and the to and fro movement between journalists and activists became very frequent. This has diluted the sanctity of the world of writing and media since this world loses a member once he or she becomes an activist. Today one may see journalists openly participating in public protests, agitations, partisan rallies, political meetings and so on. By doing so, on one hand they make it obvious that they subscribe to or belong to a certain outfit or ideology. But on the other hand, they close their connections with the other outfits or ideology and make it known to the public in general that they are one-sided and at that point their credibility as a journalist goes down. A well-known example is a famous writer Arundhati Roy. She asked in an, an interview some years ago that why should a writer not be allowed to have a strong opinion about or against something and why can't she or he take a stand? In fact, it is all right to do so, but the answer is, once you do this, you lose the large, wide spectrum appeal you have among your readers. You then belong to a party and to a cause, howsoever legitimate it may be, and you don't belong to all after that point. The art is to say the right thing as you perceive it without appearing to take sides. It is often said that of the countless friends this activist writer had made after winning her award writing book, many got disillusioned with her. The need is for public spirited individuals to remain true to one thing, either the creative world or a cause. And that is how they would command respect from all. In case of Satyajit Ray, the great filmmaker, while everyone appreciated his art and 
craft but his approach towards filmmaking was not universally acceptable some thought that he created his work mainly for a non indian audience it is therefore important to remember that even if you are an activist at heart you must have the skill to win the heart of your opponent as a journalist and this will come from your open mindedness to understand the other version as we have seen in post independence india many party oriented newspapers did not do well commercially such as the national herald and the patriot such newspapers if they wished to confine themselves to promoting one ideology only could have been better off as party organs if they existed as newspapers they had no business to promote one ideology only and black out or deride the others that is why the general readers rejected them even in states where the parties that promoted those newspapers were in power today these news, these two newspapers are nowhere in the media scene healthy mainstream journalism therefore is no less a cause promotion than mere activism this brings as to the end of the discussion on media laws and ethics as also to the unit dedicated to this topic as should be clear to all of you the press or the media is an institution which commands great respect among the people and the people also expect very high standards of fairness and impartiality from it governments of all colors and inclinations have always been interested in controlling the working of the press even in a supposedly liberal and free society of western countries especially the us the press faces all kinds of pressures from the government and the corporate sector the press there also is under constant attack for being anti establishment despite the constitution guaranteeing freedom of expression of course controls are exercised on the press in not so liberal societies and the number of journalists who are persecuted harassed harmed or even killed in the course of doing their duty continues to be alarmingly high but since journalism is a profession as well it is guided and controlled by a set of laws and on all societies there exists an organization to deal with cases of press freedom or its performance with the opening up of societies and economy as also the development of technology the media also is getting exposed to charges of partiality or wrong doing all those who are associated with this sector or wish to get associated with it share this responsibility of guarding its sanctity in the end it would be pertinent to mention the enactment of the right to information act or rti which is not essentially a law concerning the media alone but it is a law that applies to the entire society and the declared parts and departments of the government through which any citizen can seek information which he or she considers in public interest the media and a section of journalists all over the country have been using this act to get information which they think is in public interest and it has been serving its purpose not essentially as a media law but as a tool through which information can be procured by the media persons as well to do their duties in a much better function so we closed this discussion at this point and in the next topic of discussion we shall take up another exciting subject in the field of journalism and mass communication thank you and my best wishes till then